I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to put together a, a, a I wanted to share with you a, a, a couple of lines from John Kerry this morning, the Secretary of State for the United States. But unfortunately, my computer again, not cooperating, I, 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 I dub it over in another room into a file that's supposedly a shared file and it's not there. It's almost as if someone has wiped my server clean. Ah, she's not in the building today, though, so that can't possibly be happening. I, I wanted to open up the program today just to give you some some rough ideas of what we'll be talking about. We have a young man who's coming by in a few minutes, and I'll tell you something about him. Eight years old. He has become an, uh, really an honorary member of the Tuskegee, uh, is that how you pronounce it, Tuskegee Airmen? They were, uh, they were a unit, of course, there have been a couple of movies made about these men and, and their heroics during World War II. Uh, they were commissioned essentially by Eleanor Roosevelt, who, who thought that we should have some pilots flying in the war who were people of color. I, I've actually met some of them myself at various air shows over the years. But this young man had such a, a – when he saw a movie about them when he was five, developed such an, uh, such an affinity for them. He's really become an adopted member of their organization, and uh, he's got great respect and reverence at just eight years old for people who have served their country in uniform. He'll be dropping by our studio in a short while, and he'll have some things to share with us, too, as well. So I hope you can stick around for that. And we've we've got a couple of other things, too, as well I want to share with you. Uh, just some thoughts from some people uh, from the political world this morning, uh, Carly Fiorina, Newt Gingrich, and the like, about the direction we're going. Because there's a column today in the Wall Street Journal by Peggy Noonan, one of the greatest writers in America today. And she is referencing the Weimar Republic which, of course, was what they had in Germany in the 1920s, which then led to the collapse of, uh, of their economy and their government, and the result being the rise of Adolf Hitler and totalitarianism across Europe. So those are some things I'll talk about a bit later in the program. I do want to open the show, though, today and, and, and share with you a couple of, of brief things, if I could. Got a telephone call. I I'd left the office already, apparently, yesterday. Uh, but a, a fellow by the name of Randy, he left me a message on the telephone and uh, he's had an interesting uh, <laughs> interesting time calling this radio program periodically. One day he was on the air with us. He got home and someone had left him a threatening message at his house because they didn't like what he said on the radio. I remind you, he's a native of Jerome. You would not want to mess with him. But he left me a message uh, last night, and he was telling me that there is a newspaper ad uh, that is out, and it's, uh, it's about the refugee center here in Twin Falls. And they, are, they, are, they, are, they have an ad. They are floating an ad looking for people to work with the refugee center. So you can be good and compassionate and, you know, and make yourself you know, look better than everyone else in this community, I guess, is the whole, whole point about that. And then you can go down to the Presbyterian Church USA or over to the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church or wherever it is. You pretend to be a Christian. You can go over to those places and you can preen around and tell everybody about the wonderful work you've done for the, for the truly needy. So you, you've got that going on. That's the latest public relations salvo coming from the Board of Trustees who oversee that refugee center and CSI. However, I also had another telephone conversation yesterday with a fellow who, is, uh, who has been working diligently behind the scenes on this issue, we should point out in opposition. And he was telling me that at least one state legislator is now opposed and has asked for details on the program. There was another state legislator who attended one of the meetings at one of the local churches about this issue a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if he's opposed or not, but he apparently went back and told his colleagues, his peers, you better pay attention to this because there are a lot of people in this community who are not happy about this. And what really got their attention, I'm sure, were a lot of those people in those rooms vote. In fact, one thing you could say about the people who came out for those two meetings, one in Filer, one in Twin Falls, to hear the words from Pastor Sharam Hadian, is that they are very politically engaged as well. And they just aren't people who may not show up because it rains on election day. So you've got a U.S. Senator, Mike Crapo, saying that he would be willing to support a moratorium on the program, which likely opened the floodgates on this, because you have a lot of other people who are holding offices, we'll say lesser offices, that's not to demean their offices, but they're not U.S. Senators. But when somebody as powerful as Mike Crapo says, I'd be willing to consider a moratorium on this program so that we can sort it out for security reasons, all of a sudden a lot of other people in the state of Idaho who are in elective office who've been holding their tongues suddenly say, well, you know, I've been thinking about that too. And I've been thinking about the votes I might not get. 
oh, excuse me, I didn't really mean that, at least not publicly. And, and so this is this is what you've got going on with this situation. So gradually you are starting to see people stand up in the political world as well and realizing that this is an important issue for their constituents. Their constituents are not a group of KKK hood-wearing racists. They are just people who are concerned that the future of this community could, could, and that means not will, but could perhaps be impacted by some people who don't mean us well, who could be among a group of refugees coming here, and they'd like a better screening process. Even the FBI has said there's no way whatsoever to screen these people. Don't let the elitists in this community lie to you otherwise. When you have the FBI offering such testimony, that's President Obama's Justice Department, my friends. When they are offering such testimony before Congress, we better darn well listen. We have a caller with us. You're on the air with Bill Colley this morning. And first of all, it's, uh, well, we'll say welcome to 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. Oh, good morning, Bill. Uh, College of Southern Idaho and uh, other organizations just can't wait to get their hands on these millions of dollars our tax dollars, bringing these people in, and they don't care who they bring in, just as long as they get their money. Oh, I think that's a great deal of it. I, I, I think that, in fact, I don't think they've ever even given much consideration to a lot of the issues that people have been bringing up now over the last couple of months about this. I think that it, it dawned on them that, oh, gee willikers, maybe, <laughs> maybe some of these people could be dangerous, and then they sat back and they did their cost-benefit calculations and figured, well, Hey, even if they blow up a military installation, look at the money we'll get. Well, you know, even when you go down to pay your property taxes and you find out, uh, question them about uh, where is all this tax money going and why is our property taxes going up, the school system. And CSI is part of the tax problem that we homeowners are having. Well, CSI, let's be honest about this. The taxpayers of this state and, and this country really if they ever realized the power they actually had and they suddenly said, you know what, we're not going to be uh, giving you this money, you'd have a lot of programs and the like that would simply collapse. Well, try to get people to come together. That's another thing. Yeah, unfortunately, it may take some other really large event in this country in order to drive people in that direction. Thank you much for the telephone call, sir. It's 814. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 69 on our way today, I guess up in the 90 degree range, but over the next few days, it's going to be really pleasant in the sense that we'll have a high tomorrow. One forecast says of only 76, but plenty of sunshine. And several of days of the days over the next week look exactly like that. So we might be into the best part of summer as far as that happens to go. We have another caller joining us, and you're on the air. You're on Top Story. Bill, I got to say before I launch into what I want to talk about, I sure enjoy your show. You're a breath of fresh air. I love the way you stick to your principles on this subject. Thank you. Um, one thing that's always struck me about this is it seems to be that the Obama administration and the Democrats and liberals have this stated policy where they just want to flood this nation with immigrants that vote liberal policies, that will vote them into office for the next 200 years. And I think this is just an extension or an arm or part of that policy uh, bringing them into Twin Falls. Uh, Southern Idaho is one of the most conservative areas in the nation. And how do you break up that voting block? Well, you bring people in. Sure. And, I, and that's got to be one of the stated reasons for this whole thing. Paul Bedard writing at the Washington Examiner. I, I, I just printed this up before the show. This is the headline. Uh, comes from the Census Bureau. A record 42.1 million immigrants in the U.S. The Mexicans, of course, are the latest surge. Uh, but but over the last actual six or seven years, most of our refugees have come from the Islamic part of the world. Now, not all of these people are here illegally, but it's a it's a tremendous jump. They actually have a table attached here showing you how many people have been in this country at various times over the course of the last 15 years. And the numbers are just staggering that we're seeing now. I also want people to remember this. John Kasich, I don't know that it's been heavily reported yet. The liberals will love him for this. But he went out and said the other day that immigrants in the U.S. illegally are contributing significantly to the nation. So I think he just shot his feet off uh, in his effort to become the president of the United States. We, we need a wall. We need to stop immigration right now. We need to close the back door and open the front door. 
Yeah, I thank you much for the telephone call, sir. In, in John Kasich's case, by the way, Jeb Bush's numbers are so low now that Wall Street's panicking. So they're giving Jeb Bush all of it. Uh, they're, they're giving Kasich all the money they were giving Bush and saying, please say this. And so he picks up the script and says, illegal immigration is good for us. <laughs> so he's he, he's basically the stand-in now for Jeb Bush. You're on the air with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. What's on your mind? Well, if you take refugees and you come from like Syria or Iraq, and these refugees are trying to get away from this, and, and which ones are the most risk? The Christian refugees. But this is the kind of thing that's been going on. They'll get 600 uh, Muslim refugees from Syria, let's say, and 23 Christian. And this is the kind of thing that the State Department is doing. And, 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 and then, they're, of course, they're sending them here. And this is just an example of the kind of BS that is occurring. There were 1.1 million Christians in Syria before the war started there. There are now 400,000. So the question becomes, what happened to the majority, the 700,000? They're either dead or they're living in the camp somewhere or they fled somewhere else. Uh, there is a fellow in Poland who's trying to resettle them in Europe but he can't get any help from the major governments, the Western governments, the U.S., England, and various places. He's got to do it all out of his own pocket. He's a cousin, by the way, of uh, uh, Charles Krauthammer. Krauthammer was writing about this a few weeks ago and saying, these governments won't get in involved because they say that he's being exclusionary by only resettling Christians. Well, they're the ones that are at risk. And so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously, it's always situational ethics. Yeah, I or or even more worse than that. We we are living in what you would call the uh, the bizarro universe right now. Uh, it, everything that used to be normal and and right in America is now abnormal and wrong. Whether it be baking cakes, for, you know, making your choice based on your religious faith, who you're going to bake a cake for, uh, it, it, it just I, we're dealing we're dealing with a nefarious character in charge of this country too, as well, who just simply wants to vilify all of his enemies. Uh, he is he is setting a precedent that is going to be a very dangerous precedent, especially if you if you believe Peggy Noonan when she said we're entering that Weimar Republic period. Well, hey, one more quick point then. When Kerry said yesterday, if we don't honor this agreement with Iran, that that we could lose the the dollar would quit being the world's reserve currency. Now I don't know if that's a threat or leverage or blackmail. But I'm telling you, if we if the world's reserve currency isn't the dollar, I, I shudder to say what could happen to the economy in America. Yeah, I'm, I want to talk about that a little bit later, too, as well, and thank you for the call. John Kerry also said yesterday that if we don't go ahead and approve this deal with the Iranians so that they can you know, wipe out Israel, if we had to go back and try to work another deal with them, that they would no longer trust us. <laughs> the psychiatrists call that projection. <laughs> I mean, it, th these people are, are playing bats. They're, they're not criminal. They've lost their minds. 20 minutes after 8 o'clock, 69. Bill Colley with you. I've got a great guest coming up. I'm going to spend a few minutes with us in studio. want to remind you that if you're, uh, you're thinking about all that sun we'll have over the next week, and it may be one of the clearest periods of the summer, what we're going to be looking forward to over the next seven days, remember that sunshine beating through those windows. That can actually start to bleach your carpets and your furniture and your drapery. So we've been recommending for the last several months that you give them a call at Tint Lady. They'll do a free estimate. They can tint your home windows, your office windows, the windows of your car or your truck. And believe me, that will give you a little bit of a break, too, on that heat that comes through those windows when it's sunny out. You'll save on electric bills when it comes to air conditioning, of course. You can call and schedule an appointment today. The number is 736-8469. They're online as well at TintLadyIdaho.com. Locally owned and operated over 20 years of experience. The shop is at 1887 Highland Avenue, East in Twin Falls. Hours Monday through Friday. They're open in just a few minutes, in fact. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saturday by appointment only. And remember, don't squint. Get tint. So John Kerry right now, as we're speaking, he happens to be in Havana, Cuba. Uh, he is uh, parleying with his fellow travelers there. The communist government of Cuba as they reopen the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> yes, he was speaking for just a very brief period while he happened to be there. Uh, the co conversation earlier about Kerry and some of the really dopey things that he said lately when it comes to dealing with 
our sworn enemies on the other side of the planet. You know, Dick Cheney, and I know a lot of people out there when they hear that name, even Republicans, they're not terribly happy. It makes some people recoil. But I can recall right after the 9-11 attacks, it was probably within a month, Dick Cheney was at a black tie dinner. I was getting ready for work one morning, and I had television coverage on in the background. And it was being reported that Dick Cheney had given a speech at this black tie dinner about the future, and he said, look, I'm not going to make any guarantees, but this war, well, in the Bush administration, they wouldn't say this war with the Islamic world, but that's what it is. It's a clash of cultures. It, 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 it is truly a cultural war. But he said, this is going to last for generations. He said, we should expect that this could last for 50 years. I think that that was spot on. Whether or not you liked the man, I think he knew exactly what he was talking about. And yet we blithely go along in this country as if, well, if we just dialogue with them or, or we you know, accept that canard that, that it's the religion of peace— but it isn't. And that pastor who was here a couple of weeks ago speaking about this, he has some expertise that none of these liberals on the local level have. He was actually a Muslim. He grew up in a Muslim home in Iran. Came to the United States as a little boy in the late 1970s, what, 10, 12 years old at the time. He knows what it's about. He spoke about it. He can share that with you. And you know what? The dang thing is, is that the liberals like to just put their fingers in their ears, close their eyes, and they don't want to hear anything about it because they've already made up their mind being the smartest people in any room that they happen to walk into. We know how that works. It's 826. Bill Colley with you, 69. We have a caller with us. That number is 736-0300, 736-0300. You're up next. You're on the air. Hello? Yo, Bill. Yeah. One way to solve the problem is that people quit sending our kids and grandkids to CSI. Maybe they'll get the point, huh? Well, I know for a lot of people it's probably considered a bargain because it's close to home, you know, know. Being, being a two-year school. I, I, you know, and that, that would require people to – that's that's a huge sacrifice that we would, have be ha- we, we would have to ask of a lot of parents in this community, especially with the cost of college elsewhere. Yeah, well, like I say, we got to do something, don't we? I, well, thank you for the call. I, you know, it's an interesting idea. I, I, I just – I don't want to. I don't want to hurt our own families, and, and so we've got to find another way around this. This is a tough nut to crack. I realize that, but when you start having some state legislators who are looking into this matter and taking more of an interest in it, although the window of opportunity right now is is closing because the settlement date, the resettlement date, is coming up in what about sometime in October, so we're six to eight weeks away from that. If people out there in government are going to take some sort of action, then they've got to do it quickly. And I know, and let's get back to this, a lot of these people in government have great friends who've who've arrived here and opened businesses from elsewhere. There was a little thing that I read on an Irish blog the other day that I think is applicable here. And the writer was talking about the situation in England. England and Scotland and Wales right now, which is neighboring, and of course that portion that England will not return to Ireland, uh, the, the six counties in the north, Right now, Britain has an unemployment problem, 1.9 million people unemployed. They have 2 million immigrant and migrant workers, people who came from elsewhere and were resettled there. Now, why would you do that to your own people? Why? (laughs) It just, it boggles the mind. And yet, that same mindset is taking place here. And all of these people who are saying, well, this is the compassionate thing to do, they've got a job. They, they apparently aren't, aren't aware that there are other people out there who, who, who have been looking for work for a few years in some cases. So they're, they're, they're blathering on about their compassion for somebody overseas who they don't know who could be dangerous. Again, could. Let's qualify that. Could. But by golly, there are people who've been hurting here in this country. Why do you, why do you think that Trump and Sanders are resonating with such a large block of the electorate? And if the economy... And right now, what's happened with the Chinese devaluation of its currency, it's essentially thrown up, it's not technically a tariff, but it's thrown up a tariff. Well, you may remember in the late 1920s, something called Smoot-Hawley. And most of your experts today, historians and economists, believe that's what led to the Great Depression. We'll have a lot more people out of work then when that happens. What's your compassion going to be for them? Well, you know what? We need to bring another 50 million people here, I guess. (laughs) Oh, I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. (laughs) 
at 2970. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX at com. I had a quick story to share with you about uh, Quinn Thorne's visit with us. Uh, to be eight years old and to have that much knowledge about, <laughs> about flying and about aircraft. So before he left the studio, I pulled up a photograph on the computer here. Uh, I went to college. Well, it's been moved since then, but at the time, the, the National Warplane Museum was right next door. I'm not kidding. I mean, it was right next door. And what we would do is uh, we would actually sit outside during the air shows. They'd have an air show in late August, and it used to be about a week into classes the fall semester. And we would, we would sit outside and watch these massive planes, old war planes, fly over, do simulated bombing runs because there was a field just down at the bottom of the hill from the campus. And so I got quite familiar with a lot of the older aircraft there. I've got a photograph I was showing him of a, a B-17, and my dad and I are standing under one of the wings. I've got my hand uh, hands on one of the propellers. And uh, the plane was called the Fuddy Duddy. And this picture is, gosh, 30-some years old. Uh, but I was showing him that. But as soon as I showed him the picture, before I said anything else, he said, Flying Fortress. Boom. Just identified it that quickly. Knew exactly what it was when he saw it. And I told him, I said, I got a chance to fly in that plane, as it turns out. About oh, half a dozen years later, I was working as a reporter and to promote one of the air shows, they took a lot of us up and took us for flights. And then later on, I got to uh, go up uh, in a, uh, a B-24 as well. So I got a little bit of a taste of some of those old planes. They were not comfortable to ride in, by the way. Uh, we should remember that, that no matter who you were, whether you were in the uh, the pilot seat, the co-pilot seat, a navigator, or you were a gunner, or you know they had a number of different missions and roles, that most of these planes were not in any way comfortable. I just finished reading the book, in fact, a few months ago about George McGovern's unit, which they were flying in Italy near the end of the war. They were flying B-25s. And uh, about just the, the, the discomfort that these, these people had as they were especially on long missions because you didn't have a lot of room in the first place, and it was cold, and, and, and there were people who were actually shooting metal through the very thin skins of these planes as you flew over. And so the stories that these people uh, relate, those who are still alive, and here's Quinn, eight years old, who will be talking 70, 80 years from now about his experiences with people who will be long gone. So Quinn, in a sense, is going to be, he, he, he's a vessel who's carrying on that history to other people because years and years and years from now, he is going to be able to talk about being an eyewitness to the stories that these men shared with him, and they were eyewitnesses to the war. 846, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. It's 71. Also, uh, at Rob Green GMC tomorrow, they're doing a fundraiser. Uh, Quinn and his family will be there as well from 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock. And there'll be a moon bounce there. Uh, there'll be some hot dogs as well, but they're doing a fundraiser again tomorrow. At Rob Green GMC between 10 and 2 o'clock, Quinn does a lot of work around this community raising raising money for various veterans groups. Eight years old. Can you imagine that? I think at eight years old, I just remember all I wanted. Uh, just before I turned eight, my dad bought me a big red bicycle. We went down to the Western Auto. He picked it out for me. It was my first two-wheel bike, and I didn't think about anything else for the next couple of years other than riding that bike. And here's here's. Quinn just immersed in the history of, of, of World War II. Uh, just a fascinating story. Hey, I want to tell you too as well, before we, uh, we move along into the show, Dr. Jonathan Tripp is going to be joining us coming into the studio next week between 8.30 and 9 o'clock on Wednesday. And he joins us every Wednesday. And this is an opportunity for you, uh, uh, just as a listener, to get some medical advice sometimes. Very friendly medical advice, we should point out. Or maybe, you know, Bring up a point that the doctor uh, you know, could address uh, about a particular illness or a disease. We all know people who suffer from the issues that he has talked about over the last few months while he has joined us in the studio. He's going to be talking about the return to school and what that means for children. Because when school starts again, you end up with a lot of colds in the house. And I can remember when I was a kid, especially in junior high school, it seemed every year we had a lice epidemic. These things come up now and then. There are various other illnesses kids pick up at school from other students. So he's going to talk about how you can prevent that, or work at prevention. You can't prevent everything. But he also says schools themselves have become very, very adept over the course of the last several years at addressing these issues as well. So he'll be joining us next week between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. They're located, his office, 
on Fillmore Street in the city, in Twin Falls, directly across from the main post office. And remember, life's too short not to feel good. 848, we have a caller with us on News Radio 1310 KLIX, and you're on the air with Bill Colley. Good morning, Bill. Yes, sir. That was an amazing young man you just had on the phone. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> I, uh, you can tell he's extremely intelligent for an eight-year-old. And I just want to say it, young people like him, male or female, they give me hope for the future of our country. I agree with that, because somebody like that will grow up, and you know what? You only need one good leader to really point people in the right direction. Yes, sir. He just amazing kid. I hope to make it to his fundraiser tomorrow. Hey, thank you very, very much, uh, and uh, I wish you a good time there as well. I want to thank him for the telephone call. Our telephone number, 736-0300. By the way, uh, Quinn and his brother, uh, their, their dad's a huge Notre Dame football fan. Notre Dame is one of my two teams. Uh, I know in this part of the country, I shouldn't say Ohio State is the other one. Although I will admit that I have, an, before I even came to Idaho, I long had an affinity for that blue field. So my tastes may be changing. But his, uh, Quinn's dad is a is Notre Dame football fan, and uh, Quinn is named after former Notre Dame quarterback Brady Quinn. And his, uh, his brother is named Brady. So there you go. Actually, Braden, which was Brady Quinn's f- full name. Uh, and although, you know, between him and Ron Paulus and a lot of other Notre Dame quarterbacks over the last 10, 15 years, the unfortunate thing is once they actually leave the uh, leave the uh, leave the university, they don't necessarily have, well, you don't hear a whole lot about them afterwards. Ten minutes away from 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story, News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com 72, and you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. What's on your mind? I wanted to talk about that uh, Flying Fortress a little bit. I didn't catch all of those on the truck, but... Uh... My father-in-law, he flew in the old wind, and uh, that plane, it went down. He was flying right beside him. He had one more flight. He went again, and they wouldn't let him. Another guy let him fly in the plane next to him, and he was flying right there when his plane was shot down in the war. The stories I've heard about people who, can, who, who, who were there, uh, that all of this was going on around them all the time. I mean, it was just absolute mayhem, and it's amazing that they could still concentrate and finish the mission. Exactly. He uh, he was a side gunner, but he also had to complete Your call's breaking up on me, um, but I, I thank you for the input this morning. And uh, cell phone technology is a wonderful thing, but every once in a while, you know, you hit a spot if you're if you're on the move where it becomes a little difficult to uh, to communicate. There was a story out a couple of weeks ago that says yes, indeed, there are some hazards from talking on the cell phone. But I read it, thinking, oh no, because I like to talk on the phone a lot. And I read the story, and when I, when I went through it, I realized, well, all right, in order to actually have these health effects, I'd have to walk around with the phone on and, and talking to someone 24-7, which it's, it's like those old studies about saccharin when they said it could cause cancer. And so they, you know, we've got to ban saccharin because they were giving pounds of it every day to rats. And the rats would eat pounds of saccharin, and they were <laughs> developing cancers. Well... Uh, a rat wouldn't normally eat saccharin in the first place, and most people weren't drinking pounds of it every day. A little bit in a, in a in a can of pop, and that was the extent of it. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Also, during this segment of the show, I wanted to tell you about another one of our, well, one of our newest members of this program, newest advertisers joining the show, High Desert Meat Processing, where they process one animal at a time. What you bring in is what you're going to get back. Darren Van Horn, owner of High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, Idaho, has over 30 years of experience in the meat business. You can visit High Desert Meat Processing on Facebook, read reviews of other customers. Also, you can give them a call, a telephone call at High Desert Meat Processing, the number 734-9949. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking, nothing gets shipped out. Specialty meats such as jerky, pepperoni, salami, summer sausage, kielbasa, breakfast sausage, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, and more. USDA approved, Darren works closely with local beef growers and their programs to ensure quality meat. That telephone number again, 734-9949. I don't know if we'll get too, too much in depth about this this morning, but I'm trying to, you know, as I, as I move through the program today, I'm trying to hopscotch around on a lot of details. There is a story that I saw this morning that I thought was a big story, and it might be, uh, 
might be buried by a lot of media across the state of Idaho. But I figure now's a good time to get this in before we move into the next hour and hit the newscast in just a few minutes. There is a publication called IdahoNews.org, and it has a story today. We were talking in the last half hour about how some people in education seem to be more interested in money than they do about the benefits of students and their communities. Listen to this. The president of the Idaho School Superintendents Association says administrators in several districts purposely submitted incorrect teacher evaluation data to the state in an effort to protect educators' privacy. In other words, somebody might be embarrassed if if you knew they got a bad evaluation. Inaccurately reporting that every teacher received the same overall score. Teacher evaluations are important because for the first time they are tied to taxpayer dollars and that educators' ability to earn more money through the legislature's $250 million career ladder salary law. And the writer says, under Idaho's teacher evaluation system, educators can earn scores of distinguished, proficient, basic, or unsatisfactory. Scores constitute a major factor in teachers' ability to move up and down the career ladder and thus earn more or less money. And it's a a fairly lengthy story. I printed the whole thing out. It's about two and a half pages of, of, of type. But I was taking a look at this this morning before I went on air. All I can tell you is, if the goal is to protect the identities of poor teachers, then the people who are in charge of education in the state of Idaho, at the various school systems across the state, do not have your children's best interests in mind. And every year when they go to the state legislature hat in hand and demand more money, and they go to local taxpayers and they demand more money, and they tell you, but it's for the children, and if you don't give it to us, your children are going to grow up and be dumb, dumb dummies. And yet, you don't know if your, your child's teacher is a buffoon or incompetent. Why? Because they're not going to report it. They're going to try to cover this up. And I'm sure the teacher's union is in collusion with this because the union's effort is to get the uh, union members the most money they can, the best retirement benefits they can, and then teaching your children is somewhat secondary or thirdly, I guess, to the, uh, to the teacher's unions. But doesn't it strike you that somehow that these people who are so wholly unaccountable, how do you then turn around and get these, these actual rundowns? You know, when I was a kid in school, I remember one time my parents didn't want my brother to have a particular school teacher because that teacher was known in the community. You know, they didn't do a measurement system then, but was known in the community as being a bit on the incompetent side. They went to the school. And, of course, the school put up some minor, you know, argument against the idea of moving my brother to another class, but then quickly, quickly agreed with my parents that they moved my brother. And my brother, you know, ended up getting a pretty stellar teacher that year. We have a caller with us, 856. You're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Good morning, Bill. Uh, I was just listening to your program, and I have some friends that are teachers, and and they've been my lifelong friends, and they've moved out of state and taught. And I can't believe how they went so far the other side. It's uh, they're not teaching what needs to be taught; they're teaching their personal beliefs. And I think when we need to get our kids, school's good, but the education is at home with a mom and a dad, and that's where we got to get these things fixed and instill beliefs and morals and, and regiment and work ethics to our kids at home and the school's necessary, but it's more programming. I can't believe the the teachers that I know, uh, they all voted for Obama. And yeah. now that it's hitting them in the wallet, they say, well, he lied. Well, with people with open eyes seen that he lied during. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, sir. Hey, thank you much for the telephone call. Uh, two things that caught my attention in the last couple of weeks. Number one, Norman Lear, former Hollywood liberal, says he's a conservative now, and he bemoans the fact that we do not teach civics education in our schools. You may remember that we had a, a, a legislator named Jim Patrick who, who was behind that effort here in Idaho saying it's necessary because people have to understand how their government works and what it's all about and what makes America special. And speaking of special, I was reading a column from a writer last week at Personal Liberty, and he was telling the stories about his kids coming home from school. And he'd say, what did you learn today? And they'd say, we all learned we're special. And he thought for a moment, and he said to himself, 
Well, by the very definition of special, not everyone can be special. We are living in, 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 in again, as I said in the last half hour, in a bizarro universe. One more hour of the program coming up. Bill Colley with you. Hey, some thoughts from Carly Fiorina coming up in just a few minutes.